We've got some more crazy history stuff coming your way. Just like you asked for, from pirates to rivers of whiskey, today's list will leave you asking, how the heck is that real? Welcome back to The Hive, everyone. I'm your host, Rachel Fisher. And I'm Brie Room, and today we are counting down our list of 10 impossible events from history that sound like myths, part three. Part three, part three, part three. Woo. Let's get going, let's do it. At number 10, 18 month winter. If you live anywhere that gets harsh winters, then you know how annoying that it can be. Living in Canada, we know that all too well, and I can personally say that I despise winter. It basically lasts six months out of the year. If a six month winter sounds bad, then imagine how horrible an 18 month winter would be. In 1536 BCE, winter lasted a whole 18 months. Based on archeological records, a thick dust veil and darkened sky caused temperatures to drop significantly in Europe and parts of Asia. This created some pretty frosty summers and harsh winters for those living in the area at the time. It is believed that this was all caused by a volcanic eruption that shot dust particles into the air and they didn't dissipate for a long time. This phenomenon wasn't just a minor inconvenience to people though, and it greatly impacted the lives of many. It is believed that about a third of Europe's population was wiped out and death rates soared to about 90% percent in northern regions. It was quite the catastrophe. All right, number nine, Andrew Jackson. You know when you get so frustrated with someone, you just like take over and like do it yourself? You're like, come on, just, just let me do it. Well, that's probably exactly what went through Andrew Jackson's brain when he was about to be assassinated because it was so poorly done. He survived two point blank assassination attempts by the same guy, seconds apart. It was a cold, wet day in January in 1835, and Richard Lawrence waited behind a pillar inside the Capitol Rotunda. The aging president was there to attend a funeral, of all things, and Lawrence wanted to add one more body. He leapt from behind the pillar and fired. A loud bang went off, but the powder failed to ignite. Fail number one. Andrew was not pleased. And despite his aging form he was using a cane, he went at him with said cane. Lawrence quickly grabbed another pistol and the same thing happened again. Misfire. Wow. You got so close, dude, and you really messed that up. During the trial, it was confirmed that Lawrence was indeed insane and thought he was the true king of England. And according to him, the only thing standing in his way to achieving like true power was Andrew Jackson. At number eight, Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami. Imagine a great wave of sticky syrup flooding your town. What would you do? Run? Hide? Have a quick snack? Well, for people in Boston in 1915, they didn't have enough time to think about those things when the Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami happened. On January 15, 1915, a 90-foot wide cast iron cask full of 2.5 million gallons of molasses suddenly exploded. The explosion caused a wall of molasses to shoot about 15 feet high at around 35 miles per hour. This sticky situation ended up destroying buildings, carried vehicles, and even drowned people and their horses. It is said that the Boston Toffee Apple tsunami killed about 21 people and injured 150. As people started to come into the hospital after the incident, witnesses recalled the victims looking like toffee apples, which is where the name for the event came from. It took the city weeks to clean up the molasses, but even for years following the incident, people said that they could still smell the molasses in the air on a hot day. Number seven, the big package. Okay, so technically this didn't happen but it almost did. And the fact that it was even in the works, the fact that someone even thought of this and was like, yeah, that'll show the Russians. So ridiculous. No one really won the Cold War, but everyone has their perspective. But even today, the tensions between America and Russia are like pretty taut. Rather than all out trench warfare, the Cold War consisted of espionage and psychological warfare on both sides. The CIA had many plans, and one of them may surprise you. In the 1950s, Frank Wisner took over the OPC, the central part of the CIA. He sketched out the idea of how to really emasculate the Russians. Under his leadership, they drafted out a plan to drop massive condoms labeled medium to make them think that the US was superior to them, all based on the size of their John Thomases. Because when it comes to deciding whether or not to nuke another country, size matters. They would make the Russians bow to their superior sexual prowess of American men. Oh, sorry, I just almost knocked myself out with that eye roll. Whoa. Needless to say, the plan never came to fruition. 
At number six, Rabbit Army. Weird question, but if you had to choose one animal to fight an army of, which animal would you choose? Well, whatever you choose, make sure it's not rabbits, because as fun as you think an army of rabbits might be, apparently they can be quite fearsome. In 1807, after signing the Treaties of Tilts, Napoleon wanted to celebrate a bit and he wanted to organize a rabbit hunt. He asked his chief of staff to organize the hunt and apparently he went way overboard with the bunnies. Instead of rounding up a couple dozen rabbits, this man said, oh, you want rabbits? All right, bet. And he got 3,000 rabbits. 3,000 rabbits! The rabbits were released into an open field for the hunt and people thought that they would just flee and run away. But instead, the rabbits ganged up on Napoleon and his crew and the bunnies charged at them. But don't worry, these bunnies didn't have a vengeance. They were just trying to make friends. You see, the chief of staff ended up getting tame farm rabbits and they were already used to humans, so they just wanted to say hi. But could you imagine those first few moments of having 3,000 rabbits chasing after you? All right, number five, the Great Whiskey Fire. Now we talked about the molasses explosion. This is kind of similar, but also I can't believe it. I love when bartenders set your drink on fire like they're magicians, like, but the Great Whiskey Fire is nowhere close to an outstanding whiskey sour dressed up in a coop. In Dublin in 1875, 5,000 barrels of whiskey were ignited and made a river of fire in the streets of Dublin. The fire started at Malone's Malt House on Chamber Street where the barrels were being stored. Once the fire touched the barrels, obviously they exploded into a whiskey lava river of death. Unless you love a hot toddy, that is. I know a hot toddy's made with rum. I just, you know, you could, you could also use whiskey. Anyways. All you could basically do was run. It was like, it set fire to everything it touched. Water, sand, gravel were all useless against it, so Captain James Robert Ingram, the head of the fire brigade, suggested horse manure, and miraculously that worked, but imagine the smell. It was the most destructive fire in the history of Dublin, and 13 people died. As terrifying as this sounds, no one died from burns or suffocation from smoke inhalation. As the city was succumbing to the fire, crowds gathered around the pool of whiskey with pots, pans, hats, and boots to collect some for themselves. The people that did die, died because they got alcohol poisoning from drinking the contaminated whiskey from the street. I shouldn't laugh at that, I'm sorry. You can't make this stuff up. It's one of the reasons Irish and whiskey go hand in hand. I mean, what? Don't drink whiskey that's a lava street covered in horse manure. Don't do that. At number four, blue eyes. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster is one of, if not the worst, nuclear disaster in history. The explosion was caused by a flawed reactor that was being operated on by inexperienced workers. The initial disaster took the lives of 31 people and almost half a million people were evacuated from the area. So many lives were affected by the disaster and the intense nuclear radiation. The firefighters who battled the fires from the explosion were some of the most affected by the radiation and it's almost unbelievable what happened happened to their physical appearances because of the exposure. According to records, their skin started peeling off and their eyes turned bright blue. One of the Chernobyl firefighters who was affected by the nuclear radiation had his eyes go from dark brown to light blue. He was so heavily affected by the radiation that when he was buried, he was put into a coffin sealed with zinc to counteract the radiation. All right, this one's super cute and you might die, so get ready. Number three, Sergeant Stubby. I already know this movie is gonna make me cry. Dogs, man. If dogs are in movies, I'm done. We really don't deserve dogs, okay? We don't. Sergeant Stubby was actually a real heroic doggo. While training for combat in 1917, Private Robert Conroy found a little brindle puppy with a short tail. He named him Stubby, and little did he know that he would become a decorated war hero. Stubby became their mascot for the 26th Yankee Division, 102 Infantry. He learned bugle calls, the drills, and even like a little donkey salute. He would lift his right paw and just salute his head, and was the only animal allowed at camp. Conroy snuck him aboard the SS Minnesota, and the crew was won over by him, obviously, because he was so cute. How could you not? They brought him to the front lines and Stubby saved life after life. He woke soldiers during a gas attack. He rescued fallen soldiers on the battlefield by following the sound of English calls. He could distinguish the languages. He even captured an enemy spy. After this incident, he was promoted to Sergeant Stubby. Because how can you not? He captured an enemy spy. He did his job. Sergeant Stubby served and survived 17 battles, staying with Conroy even until after the war. He finally passed away in 1926, his service complete. 
complete. All right, at number two, Huberta the Hippo. You've probably never heard of Huberta the Hippo, South Africa's most famous hippo, so I'm going to tell you about her and what made her so extraordinary. In 1928, Huberta the Hippo walked 1,600 kilometers or 1,000 miles, traveling from her home in the St. Lucia estuary to East London. Huberta became quite the celebrity on her journey as she drew in large crowds of people wanting to see her and give her food. Along her journey, she even stopped at a country club, a theater, and even the beach. After failing to capture Huberta, she was officially declared royal game, meaning no one could harm her. Sadly, however, just a month after arriving in East London, she was shot by a couple of farmers. People were so upset that these farmers harmed Huberta that they demanded their arrest. The farmers were arrested and fined 25 pounds, which was a lot back then because it was the Great Depression. Huberta's body was given to a taxidermist in London, and in 1932, Huberta's body was sent back to South Africa, where thousands of people gathered to welcome her home. Number one, last but not least, Ching Shi. I love Pirates of the Caribbean. It's my jam. Pirate. Yee. Yeah. Before I knew how bad pirates would actually smell in real life, Jack Sparrow. Loved him, but really couldn't get like six feet next to him. He would have smelled so bad. But a movie series seriously needs to be made about Ching Chi. Her story is incredible. She became known as the terror of South China due to her massive fleet of over 50 to 70,000 pirates. She started out working as a woman of the night until one night she met Cheng Yi, the pirate captain who ruled over the red flag fleet. The captain proposed to her and she said yes under the condition that they would share the power of the fleet and the plunder. Together, they launched a fleet of over 1,800 ships. They were highly organized, ruthless, and disciplined. Sadly, six years into their marriage, her husband died, leaving Ching Shi alone to rule. She ran a tight ship, handing out fierce punishments to all those who disobeyed her orders. She was strict with her prisoners, keeping her men in check should any woman be taken in. Should they take a wife, fine, but they had to remain faithful. If they didn't, well, dead. If they took a woman against her will, dead. Any who deserted would be hunted down and tortured, then killed. The Red Fleet eventually felt like a floating country, even routinely taxing villages. The Chinese government eventually realized they couldn't defeat her. They were so scared, so instead of um, going to battle, they made a bargain. A bargain that allowed her to retire to wherever she liked with all of her riches and her uh, new bow. So. It's good to be a pirate queen. And that is all the time we have for today, folks. And if you like this list, be sure to give us that thumbs up and remember to subscribe. But if you want a part four, let us know in the comments. Share this video with your friends. Until next time, I've been your host, Bree Room. And I'm your host, Rachel Fisher. And until next time, stay sweet, peace. Bye.